Ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to Dr. Andane Andan Chamber and to the fifth inaugural lecture. I am Sauda Belko Sulemana. May I now call on Professor Israel Jumeku, a Dean of Students, and Alhaji Kasim Bawa, Assistant Registrar, Training and Development, to give us the Christian and Muslim prayers perspective. Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth shall pass away, but thy words shall not. We want to thank you for the safe arrival of our council chairman and his colleagues. We want to thank you for the safe arrival of the vice chancellor and his entourage. We want to thank you for the safe arrival of our eminent chiefs. We want to thank you for the safe arrival of our colleagues from the other campuses for this very important lecture. Aguable, today is a special day in the annals of UDS and particularly the academic life of Professor Seydou Alassane, the Pro Vice Chancellor, as he delivers his inaugural lecture, being the fifth of UDS. The topic of the lecture is without controversy of enormous importance to the economy of Northern Ghana, in particular, and Ghana as a whole. As such, we are obliged to commit both the delivery and the audience into your safe hands for leadership and guidance for a successful event. At the end of the day, we give you the glory for seeing him through, help him and support him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Almighty Allah, it is through your favors and mercies we gather this afternoon for the fifth inaugural lecture to be delivered by our Provost Chancellor, Professor Siro Al Hassan. Almighty Allah, we submit ourselves in prayer and invite your divine presence into our midst to take control of the occasion and to preside over it. Almighty Allah, I ask you to grant our speaker, Professor Al Hassan, confidence, willpower to deliver the lecture successfully. And we, the audience, Almighty Allah, I ask you to give us the good listening power to understand the moral message of the lecture and to be a gym. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Al Rahmanir Rahim, Malik Yomidin. Ya can Abu Duaiya can a Sain. Edina Surat al Mustakim. Surat al Lazina Anna Amta Alehim. Gayr al Magdubi Alehim Waladolim. Am. Thank you very much, Prof. Jumeku and Alhaji Our eminent chiefs, and I wish to acknowledge the presence of um, Sandarna, our landlord, the clergy senior members present, senior engineer staff, members of the press, 
ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> it is my pleasure to introduce the chairman for this event. This is the fifth inaugural lecture of um, persons in UDS who have attained the rank of professor. The chairman for today's occasion has been working with the University for Development Studies for 21 years. He has held various positions in this university. Examination officer, head of department, dean of the faculty, convocation representative to council, pro vice chancellor, and finally, vice chancellor. The chairman for today's occasion, distinguished invited guest, is Professor Gabriel Ayute. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, if you don't respond, I'll do it again. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> chairman of council, who happened to be with us, and his team of members of the governing board of UDS. Acting principals of UDS, deans, directors, members of convocation, our review chiefs. I can see my good friend and father here, so very good chief. Invited guests, families of Professor Sidu Alassan, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced by the registrar, we are here this afternoon to have the fifth inaugural lecture in UDS. I'm sure people will be asking what is inaugural lecture. For those who are not aware of what it means, when you attain the status of a professor, normally we say full professor, we have professors, but we have full professors. The rest are not half, they are associate professors. <laughs> it's like you have director one and director two, or deputy director and a director. So when you get to the status of a final professor or a professor, when the associate is removed, it's different from assistant professor. You need to tell the whole world, the academic world, of what you are professing what makes you a professor. So today we have a gentleman, he tells me he comes from a village called Josonyaeli, <laughs> near Tamale. And he rose to the rank, he attended his basic school there, went through the A level, O level, A level, and ended University of Cape Coast for his first degree, and later went to Legon and got his PhD. And since 1997, he's been working in UDS. In UDS, he held several positions. Acting head of Department of Economics and Entrepreneurship, 1999 to 2001. Coordinator, Department of Applied Business and Mathematics, 99 to 2010. Vice Dean, Faculty of Mathematical Sciences, 99 to 2010. UDS Monitoring Coordinator, 2015 to 2018. Director, ISE, now IRAS, 2010-2015. Acting Pro Vice Chancellor, 2015, 20, within 2015 and currently provides Chancellor Substantive since 2015. As I mentioned, he was the former director of the institute during his tenure. The institute did a lot of good works 
worked extensively with UNDP, projected a university in the very high limelight. He has also since becoming the Pro Vice Chancellor, be chairing this our very important fraction program of UDS, the third trimester practical training program we call TTFPP. He's be chairing the school welfare board and so many other scholarship committee board, research committee, and any other thing that the pro vice the vice chancellor would not like to do, the pro vice chancellor does. Whether there's payment for it or not. He has received a number of fellowships, including African Economic Research Costorum of Africa Economic Fellowship and the University of Ghana Fellowship. He is a network member of a network and research officer of African Economic Research Costorum, a member of the Ghana Association of Agricultural Economics. He's also presented, sorry, represented the Northern Region of Ghana as a commissioner on the National Development Planning Commission. I think they just finished their term. He has, att he has attended several international conferences. Those of you who have the brochure, you'll see the list there. Don't need to bore you with that. He has experience in design of civil or civic education and capacity building programs in leadership, democracy, empowerment, gender, data management, conflict management, environmental protection, sexual reproductive health, social accountability and microfinance. And he has been a resource person for several workshops with this capacity. Between 2003 and 2004, he was a visiting scholar at the North Carolina University in the US. And between 2011 and 2017, a chairman of Dahin, Danchelli, sorry, uh, I think Danchelli, I'm right, Danchelli School Management Committee. He also doubled as assembly member for the Tamale Metro Assembly from 2009 to 2012 and Sanerego District Assembly member from 2012 to 2015. In 2014, he used the opportunity to work on a project as a director of, for the Savannah Human Development Report with UNDP. Professor Sedu Alassan has several review publications, and that's what is making him a professor today. Over 40 public review papers in journals. is the author of two books, namely Writing Thesis, A Guide for Social Science Students, and the second one, The Sheer Industry, Knowing the Fundamentals both published by the Institute for Continuing Education and Interdisciplinary Research then of UDS. He has also contributed a lot to and positively influenced several research publications, including the Overseas Development Institute ODI Research Study on Economic Growth in Northern Ghana. He is a co-founder of the Jusonyali Nasara Education Fund, and fund, a fund which provides financial support to poor and needy students. He is married with seven children. He didn't tell us how many wives he has. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this young man or elderly man now from Jusinaeli. I present to you Professor Sedu Alahassan to deliver his lecture. This, the Vice Chancellor is a seasoned researcher 
and I believe he can do his own research to find out the number of wives. <laughs> It's okay. Okay. Yeah, it's Mr. Chairman, who doubles as the chair for this important occasion? The chairman for the Governing Council of UDS and members of UDS Governing Council. The registrar. UDS campus principals, deans and directors, members of convocation, Nanima, because I can see our landlord presence, Sandarna. My good friends from the media, my students, both past and present. Invited guests, I've seen Honorable Municipal Chief Executive of San Argo Municipal Assembly. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, it has already been stated that this is the fifth of the inaugural lecture series of UDS. And I take this opportunity to sincerely welcome all of you to this important celebration and to thank you so much for according it the prominence that it deserves. Mr. Chairman, all over the world, trees are viewed as very, very valuable natural resources. Why? Because they offer us, as humankind, numerous advantages, be it social, economic, cultural, or even health-wise, trees are so important. And trees are even accorded almost the same rights like human beings, the right to live the right to be protected, and even the right to be regenerated. And I understand in some countries, trees, they have birth certificates. Why? Because you cannot just go and indiscriminately fell the tree, just to tell us how important trees are. Mr. Chairman, there is this important tree protection action that has ever taken place on earth, and I would like to share that with you. That is what we call the survivor tree. I was in the United States in 2017, and that is where I got this story. What is all this about the survivor tree? We all heard about the 9-11 disaster, where we lost lives. Over 20,000 people died. The United States lost almost everything. But in the process of clearing the debris of the fire and whatever, they found one important thing, a tree that was reduced to an eight-foot tall. They found that. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened to this tree? The United States government instructed the New York Garden City, go and bring back this tree to life. And the tree was brought back to life. 
the eight foot tall stump was taken to the garden and after 10 years, Mr. Chairman, the tree survived. And that is why they call it the survivor tree. And it is the gallery pear tree I'm talking about. Mr. Chairman, why is this so important? The survivor of the tree signifies two things. It is a sign of survival and a sign of resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm talking to you now, there are several tourists foreign to see that tree in the United States, and it is fetching the country so much foreign exchange earners. I think I just want to state that trees, particularly economic trees, have value, and we shouldn't play around them. Pardon me to take you back a bit. In the olden Ghanaian culture, we used to create shrines or sacred groves. And these groves or shrines meant for something. They had values and ethics. And these values and ethics brought about the protection of the environment. Don't go there and cut the tree, and nobody went there. But now they are not there. So why have we discontinued this rich cultural values? Why? And because we have discontinued these values, it has brought about the indiscriminate felling of trees, particularly economic trees. Ladies and gentlemen, I have shared with you what other countries are doing to protect their trees. I have told you the story of the survivor tree. So what am I coming to talk about? Mine is not the gallery pear tree. Mine is the shea nut tree. So I'm going to look at the shea industry, the shea tree, our heritage, and how we can sustain that industry. I will share with you the socioeconomic importance the challenges that impede the growth of the industry and how we can collectively sustain the subsector. I'm doing this because there is a message and a philosophy behind my lecture. What is the message and what is the philosophy? Yesterday, one of my colleagues approached me and said, who asked you to work in the share industry? Who asked you to do that? I think, I chose to do that because I have been working in that area. I have been looking at policy issues. I have been looking at adoption issues. I have been looking at the marketability and quality control systems in so far as the industry is concerned. And that is the motivation. Mr. Chairman, it's only one message that I'd like you to carry home. And what is this message? No share tree, no share industry. That's all. So when you are going home, if you don't get anything at all from this room, I think you should remember. No share tree, no share industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this discussion, this presentation, this lecture is very important. And I'll tell you why. This country is trying to push for sustainable development. And one way of achieving it, Mr. Chairman, is to true tree protection and regeneration. If we joke with our environment, it will affect the sustainability growth that we are talking about. The, the building of this nation beyond aid cannot also be achieved. So I think that at the end of the day, the policy recommendation that I shall be providing here will be very, very useful for achieving, especially the one district, one factory policy. The sustainable development goals also have one thing, the motto that the route to dignity by the year 2030. 
So we are on the road to dignity. And if we leave the trees behind, Mr. Chairman, it will be dangerous. So the policy recommendations of this lecture shall also be useful for implementing some of the SDGs that we know. And also we have the Africa Agenda 2063 that stresses the need to reduce poverty in rural areas. We cannot do this without trees. We've all heard the president of this country talking about positioning Ghana beyond aid. Even now, World Bank is trying to help to understand it because it's very important. What goes into building Ghana beyond aid? What does it mean? But in the opinion of the policymaker in this country, this is what it entails. It entails an aggressive industrialization process. Yes. Because countries that have attained economic independence have done so through industrialization. So it's, that is the only way Ghana can achieve that aim of building the country beyond aid if we embark on aggressive industrialization. So how does the share story come in? How? Because if you look at the policy uh, initiatives of government, it talks about four things. Making existing local industries more competitive. The share industry qualifies. Promoting small and medium enterprises development in this country, the share industry qualifies. Promoting export diversification so that we move away from the traditional exports, cocoa, bauxite, and diamond, and to put some emphasis on our non-traditional exports, the share industry again qualifies. Mr. Chairman, and more so, we want to promote made in Ghana products. Made in Ghana. So the share industry, again, qualifies. So therefore, Mr. Chairman, all that I want to say is that Ghana's share industry offers a very, very significant opportunity for industrial transformation in this country. There is a saying that seeing is believing. Mr. Chairman, permit me to share with you some 14 minutes kind of documentary, and then maybe that will tell all the story that I've been struggling. It is do. said that shea butter is a cocoa of the northern region, and this is a reason why. 100% pure natural shea butter is highly rich in vitamin A, an essential mineral vital to the skin. When used as a moisturizer, the shea butter is the only seed oil that relieves over 30 skin conditions, a property that makes shea butter the preferred ingredient for most skincare brands and also the underlining factor behind the industry's fast growth. The shea industry occupies an important place in the Ghanaian economy. Um, it's a sector that is very unique because it depends on a natural resource, a crop that is said to be naturally given to us by name the Shear Three. The tree is of economic importance and I think researchers will need to support the efforts the government is making to ensure environmental sustainability. The shea industry has contributed a lot in raising foreign exchange for this country. Ghana's shea industry has attracted so many investors and it has a potential to contribute to the growth of this nation. Share at whatever level, whether at the nut level and at the butter level, is very important, and even at the tree level. So the butter is used at uh, two levels. First is looking at it in terms of uh, skincare, 
uh, these days you go to the market and then you can have a lot of uh, shear based products that you can use as cosmetic products. Uh, so it's very uh, important uh, because it's a major ingredient in formulating um, products that are very good for uh, skin care. Then um, also it's used in chocolate formulation, that is in the food industry. And that is why many people do not know. In fact, 90% of our global exports of shea kernels go into the food industry in the form of chocolate. We call it cocoa butter equivalents. In other words, whatever cocoa butter can be used for, uh, shea uh, can be used. And that is uh, the product of shea we call shea stearine. It's extracted from the butter and used in chocolate formulations. Until recently, most women within the rural areas of northern Ghana used shea kennel in butter trade for items like foodstuff, bowls, mat, and calabash. But with shea butter now gaining international appeal, these women now sell the kennel they collect to small shea factories who then churn out butter from the raw kennel, making the shea tree a potential cash cow for the nation. It is of so much social economic importance uh, in the sense that it offers employment opportunities for several people, especially the rural poor in northern Savannah. Majority of the key players in the industry are women. So this simply means that if the share industry is developed, First of all, it will help this country to reduce poverty among the rural people. In terms of economic importance, it creates jobs at the local level. Currently, there are about 900,000 women uh, in the shear zone that is from part of uh, Northern Volta, Baja, for all the way to Upper East, Upper West. Um, women who earn their livelihoods from share, either by picking, by processing, and by selling uh, directly. So in terms of job creation, share uh, has the potential, and we see it as a socio-economic crop. It's not like uh, cocoa and other crops that is considered as a cash crop. Share has socio-economic dimension because it involves so many people. Actually, I started with a 45 women's group at uh, Gumo. But as of now, I was talking, I have about 670 women processing. And I've been able, through the business that I'm doing, I've been able to put a structure for six communities for the women to be sitting down and doing the processing. When I started with them since that long time, there was a saving. So I was wondering how they are going to be making things easier for themselves. We started the last two years with the women. Out of 670, I registered uh, 400 women out of the 670 women into the SMART account. So at the beginning of this uh, season, uh, last year's season, I told them that nobody is going to tie them the amount until the end of the year. So that end of the year, in fact, a lot of them didn't believe. What uh, sparked them was one woman child was going to training college. So the husband got only 500 Ghana city. So he came in, she came in here and told me, oh, Rabbi, I want to see whether the small money that I used to save into the account, whether it can be up to 400. Instead, the one will look at the, the saving inside she did. It was 900 plus. She was even weeping here because she didn't even know that the money is up to that. So we would draw that 900 and he went and added to the husband money to be able to pay the child's school fees and the child went to school. With just six of these makeshift factories, Rabiatu has been able to employ over 1,200 women who work as collectors and factory hands, an indication that a bigger and a more advanced factory could give several more thousands jobs and a means of earning a living. So they are breaking it into, into a powder thing. My name is Yakuba Fisheti, and I'm a share nut picker. I always get up early in the morning from 4 to 5, going to the bush to pick share nuts. If I'm going that time, I always meet uh, uh, snakes on the way. 
The mission sector has witnessed some evolutions, including uh, more knowledge and more efforts at addressing some of the challenges. Uh, one of such challenges is the challenge at picking level where women will normally have a kind of snake bites. So what has happened has been SMV interest in developing uh, a technology that will reduce the risk of uh, contact with snake bites. It's also to reduce the stress associated with waste pains and burning to pick the nuts. And also level of efficiency and uh, how fast a woman should be able to collect, reducing the timing in collection. So came the production of the SMV uh, uh, shear roller. The roller machine is used to roll over the nuts and then it picks it. So it picks and then a certain volume is uh, collected, then the woman can easily offset it. At this small share factory owned by Tama Cosmetics, the true value of the share kennel is revealed. After the butter has been extracted, the residue is separated into two components. The brown powdery matter which is used by farmers as fertilizer and the dark solid matter which is used as coal to ignite fire. Now, apart from the job creation in terms of the food support and stuff like that, the raw materials are also now becoming very important in energy generation. Even when I went to uh, Ouagadougou, uh, Burkina Faso recently, we went to a processing center where firewood is not being used. And so, uh, globally, we are now talking about climate change. And uh, shear is very important in terms of uh, climate res resilience. Uh, is re uh, resistant to uh, floods, fire. You see how it goes. Uh, every year there's a lot of fire hazards and the tree is standing there. All the three components, the butter, the fertilizer and the coal are in high demand. Here they are packaged and exported separately to different customers. Because of the widespread of coverage and the number of people who earn little, little income. In fact, our current export is about 70,000 metric tons per, per annum. Um, I mean, these are rough estimates of uh, our capacity. Our cocoa is almost about 100,000 tons. With all the cocoa breeding, uh, mass cocoa spraying, and the cocoa research institute, with all the dedicated attention, data available, uh, uh, cocoa syndicated loans, government investment, is yet to hit a million metric tons. But uh, sheer as it's in the world and people are collecting the data that we have, is about 78,000 uh, metric tons. So it means that if there was dedicated attention, legislation, regulation, organized focus entity, authority, a board to look at sheer, at the level of propagation, look at shear, at the level of uh, conservation, supply seedlings, protect the wild trees, do research and development, look at more added uh, value products, look at internal value additions, look at rural level issues, collection, hand, uh, hand gloves, uh, uh, and all that, the entire value chain. If we have a focus entity that is looking at the peculiar challenges of shear, we believe that Either it will be next to cuckoo or it will be more than uh, cuckoo. And the, in, the, in terms of the coverage of uh, uh, people that will earn their livelihood through an expanded uh, share sector, will be very massive. And for us, we see that share is a kind of a key, in other words, a precursor to reducing poverty in the entire share zone or the, uh, uh, the northern territories. When I landed in Ghana in 94, I think Ghana was capable of producing 150,000 tons of shear nuts for export. Now, we'll be lucky if we can do 60 or 70,000 tons. That's only enough for one factory. We have many factories in, in Ghana producing shear butter, and we cannot even feed those factories from the material of shear nuts from this country. In 2001, a survey was carried out, satellite survey, and in the three northern regions, there was 2.6 million hectares of what we call open forest, where the canopy cover of trees is between 15 and 60 percent. It's now less than 600,000 hectares. We've lost, we've degraded 80 percent of our sheer parklands. The sheer landscape is under attack.
I think the most important thing now is for every stakeholder to ensure that the trees are protected. The existing shared trees must be protected. And then efforts must also be made to even plant more trees. We need to develop shared parklands. We need to embark on commercial shared tree planting so that we can sustain the activities of the shared industry. Everybody is cutting the trees down. They're cutting the shear trees, they're cutting all the other trees, and they're clearing the, the lands for farming and for urbanization. But nobody is replacing them. So we've now got this big group of partners together. We have Form International, we have Form Ghana, and we're working with about 40 communities, over a thousand farmers directly, in order to start planting trees across northern Ghana. What we are trying to do is that we want to set up pilots on these parklands that we established. We have already had a lot of cheese buying into it. And uh, they are thinking that if we combine with them, with these groups that are there, then we should be able to establish more plantations in the system and then also improve upon the parklands that are already there. Without a comprehensive data, uh, people are relaxed. Investors are not encouraged because they don't know the benefits they didn't know the investment potential that exists in the industry. So there is a need to encourage even a national census, and this could be done by the government. A national census is needed so that we can build a data pool for the industry that will help this country in planning and protecting the share industry. As a share butter quickly gains popularity, value outside the shores of West Africa, industry players will need to do more to shore up the supply of the product as demand increases. Mr. Chairman, so let's come back to continue, and I think this has already taken a lot of what I will have to say again. Um, you know, history is very, very important in our society, history, because it enables you to know where you are coming from. So where is this sheer industry? Where is it coming from? What is the story behind Ghana's sheer industry? Mr. Chairman, you see, the sheer industry happened to be a gift of God for the African continent. It is only in Africa that you find it. So the belt that we find there, this green belt, indicates where one can find shared thing. Ghana, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, all down that the Sahil belt in some portions of South, Central Africa. But in Ghana, we have it in the northern belt. And it was surprising, some estimates have been done to indicate that we can talk about 9.5 million share trees in this country. With a huge potential of generating foreign exchange earnings to Ghana. Very, very huge. The share nuts alone can give us over 100 million per annum. And when you take every hectare in the northern belt, you can count adult trees, about 27 of them, averaged. And for the young ones, you can talk about 0 to 12. The potential is there. Mr. Chairman, 
The history and the story that I want to hammer here is that this is an industry that pro started producing just to meet domestic markets. And now it is internationalized. It's gone far. Go to Netherlands, go to wherever you have share products. So it's opened and it's helping, if I can borrow economics language, to open the economy of Ghana. That is the story. Government is now putting in efforts to move the industry forward. Civil society organizations are working hard to sustain the industry. Development partners, European Union, UNDP, USA, Food and Agriculture Organization, ladies and gentlemen, they are all designing programs and actions just to move this industry forward. Mr. Chairman, before 1970s, nobody was talking about selling these products in the international market. Production targeted only local and district markets. 1970 and 1980, that 10-year period, then production moved from the district level to include the regional boundaries. Look at the growth. Then between 1980 and 1990, it gained international recognition. That is the story. 1990-2000, we then started organizing these scattered, small and medium scale producers into cooperatives so that they can pull resources to, together. And this, that was the time civil society organizations then began to play advocacy roles in order to attract investors. And then it also marked the beginning of investment in the share industry. 2010 onwards, Mr. Chairman, the point I want to highlight there is that there is now the promotion of scientific research. I think that is just what I want to stress. People have started nursing seedlings so that you can go and plant it. I saw it feel it, feel it, three days ago when my good friend, I will be talking about him, Dr. Peter Love invited me to one bomb community here where they are planting shea trees and dawa dawa trees. It's happening. This is how the industry has evolved from nowhere now to the international picture. Mr. Chairman, we just saw from the documentary, and then it was stated that it is an opportunity for women to improve their livelihood situation. Yes, it is true. The socioeconomic importance of the industry is so enormous. First of all, it's one way by which we can reduce or alleviate poverty and empower them. Look at the women, they are now so happy they can raise their hands up now. You meet with them. They have confidence in themselves now and can contribute even at meetings because of the power of the Shia. They now have voice. One researcher put it that it's women's gold. The Shia is women's good. You want to empower the woman? Provide assistance for the Shia business. Mr. Chairman, this woman is even demonstrating the kind of 
I don't know whether it's dollars or CDs, it should be CDs. How she earns from it. And it's an industry that employs almost one million rural women. And their income is increased as we learn from Ghana Share Alliance. From 19, 2015, women have witnessed consistent increase in their incomes. And this is helping some of them to even pay for their war school fees. As for contribution to gross domestic product, it is clear. Ghana is earning so much from the share industry. And according to ESE, it ranked second in terms of non-traditional agricultural exports after cashew. After cashew. So it's bringing so much foreign exchange earnings to this country and contributing to gross domestic um, products. Ladies and gentlemen, the sector has also witnessed increased investment. We talk about private sector organizations pumping in their private resources into it. We have over 200 share cooperatives pumping in their time and energy and resources into it. And what is even more interesting is that across the country we have seven companies dealing with the processing of shit spread across the country. Tema, Bupi, Savlugu here, you know, they are spread. They are all, they've all seen the benefit. So it means that even the share, even though you have the trees here, but the benefit has a spillover to the rest of the country. Mr. Chairman, there are other benefits, medicinal, food security, and then the politicians always say job for the boys, but I want to add that she can offer job opportunity for both boys and girls, as we can see from the picture. The children after school, they engage in this. And from some of the interviews I had, some of them have been able to buy bicycles which they can use to go to school from that. Mr. Chairman, the industry has some challenges. Recently, we just heard of the disease, but the information came after I had done my lecture. So that's why I put that one in red to show that yes, it's there, but I haven't gone so much into that. So we've all heard about it. There are some diseases cropping in. Maybe the scientific researcher, we will have to take it out from here. And one important thing I would like to stress here, Mr. Chairman, is that there is no clear direction into which here is going. There's no policy. We've heard about 10-year development plan for the cashew, but what are we going to do about the share? But of course, some efforts are being made. I will mention that later. There is no also comprehensive data, as we heard from the documentary. And then there is this decline of the shear trees. The shear tree, people like cutting it for two reasons from my research, two reasons. The first is that people think that tree is just a wild tree. It just grows like that, it's wild. So you just go and then you can cut. The second reason is that it is the most qualitative source of fuel wood. It is only shear tree you can cut today and use the wood as source of fuel. It is oily in nature, so there is some quality in the people prefer having it for their sources of energy. Mr. Chairman, I think Winrock did a research and came out with a point that there are so many forms of deforestation 
but bush burning is the major cause of that. Other people also go in cutting the trees indiscriminately and using some of the wood for other things like what we are seeing on the board. But what I just want to highlight here, ladies and gentlemen, is to borrow the words of Curry. I think he, I don't know whether he's still alive, he said this in 1985 in his book, Bushfires. He has warned that man can never benefit by acting against nature. It's not possible. By acting against nature, you can never benefit. You can only benefit if you cooperate with nature. So all these kinds of burnings, cutting, and whatever, ladies and gentlemen, we are acting against nature. And if we do that, the share industry will not succeed. Mr. Chairman, I already mentioned the lack of policy, policy direction. And because there is no policy direction, this diagram is telling you how zigzag, how volatile the export earnings from sheer nut and butter are behaving. Because there is no policy to stabilize it. So it is volatile. And with this, you cannot predict income. So that is the biggest challenge. But, Mr. Chairman, let me end by asking a question. Is, it, is the industry sustainable at all? Because that is the, the topic that I have chosen. Is it sustainable? My answer is yes. And you may ask me, what are the reasons? The reasons are many. I will just share a few of them with you. Mr. Chairman, the number one reason is this, that development partners are developing interests in investing, in promoting, in supporting the industry. So that is one of the biggest indicators. European Union, Food and Agriculture Organization, JICA, they are all supporting in the area of research, finance, and capacity training. So that is a very good example. And I think we have some projects uh, like the Shear Parkland Development Project, which is sponsored by Food and Agricultural Organization. We also have the Sustainable Share Initiative Project, which is sponsored by the USA. So these are clear examples that donor partners are recognizing the economic importance of the industry and they want to assist. The government too is doing something. Recently we heard about um, that we will soon have a share board somewhere 2024. There is a roadmap, and I think if government is very you know, willing, this roadmap, as soon as we get there, I think the share industry would now have a direction. The government has also set up a 50-member national steering committee, and I, I see that to be a sustainable indicator. It has facilitated the establishment of share processing factories. And then also, some ministries have started reviewing their mandates. I have been told that for the one district, one factory policy, three districts in Northern Ghana have expressed interest to set up share factories or industries. The Zabzugu district is one, one municipal is another, Sisale East and Sisale West they will want to go in and set up shared industries. So that is why I earlier on said that if the one district, one factory is going to be achieved, then we should stop cutting the trees. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, some NGOs too have been making efforts. Uh, there are networks like the Share Network Ghana. They help to bring a network producers across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, research institutions too are doing well, and then uh, UDS is part of it. We do some research works as well as Food Research Institute and SARI combined together. There is some amount of work going on. 
There is also scientific research into how we can nest the seedlings to be able to plant the trees in order to sustain the industries. Mr. Chairman, let me just stress this point that there have been some innovations which is very interest arousing, very heart touching. And I think we need to look at that one too. Uh, and it's in the area of how to pick the nuts, how to crush, how to roast, how to knead, and how to boil. What are these innovations, ladies and gentlemen? If you look at them, you will realize that this woman is bending down to use the hand to pick. So that is those days. Even though some of them still do it, it's a traditional mode of doing it. But there has been an improved way of that, which we saw in the clip. This implement enables the woman now to do the picking much more safer. We also have this lady or woman trying to crush the nuts. Look at how she's sitting. And it's business. But we've moved away from this stage to another level where we have these three women putting their efforts together to do it in an improved way. And going further, we have even still now having machines to help the process. All this is to increase efficiency. Mr. Chairman, for roasting, this is how we used to do it. This is an improvement. This is even better. And I believe that going forward, scientists will still come out with some more improvement in the area. And this woman is also using the hand to beat, to knead. Now, when we did some interviews, we realized that if we give this woman 200 kilograms of sheer um, nuts to process it this way, she will use 20 hours to do that, 200 kilograms. She will need 20 hours, almost one day. But the same 200 kilograms, you give it to a woman to use this improved method, you only need 30 minutes. So that tells us the kind of efficiency, the kind of you know, improvement in the industry. So it's not only going to be help to add value, but it's even going to help us to even attract more quality so that the woman can gain more income. So soon, conclusion. Mr. Chairman, permit me to conclude. So I want to conclude. <laughs> the share industry is a valuable natural resource. Ladies and gentlemen, it has no close substitutes. That's it. Where are you going to get it? There is no close substitute for it. So we have to give it the needed attention. And when we continue to cut these trees like this, indiscriminately, it adds to the savanization, that's how I can call it, the savanization of the region. And even if we don't take care, what it simply means is that it's going to eat away the sustainability that we want to talk about. And the industrialization process that the government is trying to achieve will not be achieved. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, for us to have a strong, sustainable share industry, we need to ensure that there is continuous existence of the trees. We need to ensure that the trees are always available, and more so, we have access to them. So existence, availability, and accessibility are very key things. After all, as I started, no share tree, no share industry. I wish I could put this in a song, but I'm not very good in making a song. What do I recommend? I recommend that there should be 
a clear policy direction for this year. The board that President Nana is talking about is long overdue. So let's speed up the process. Mr. Chairman, we need to improve the way the women adopt the improved methods of share processing, especially with emphasis on extension delivery. And finally, we need to protect the trees. And who is to do that? Who is to do that? You can see from the photograph. All of us have to be part of the process to watch over the share tree. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I wasn't in existence some time back. Now, I was brought to existence. And then somebody took me to school, took care of me, and then friends also, you know, supported. I just want to say that I want to give some acknowledgments, if chairman would permit me. Okay. So I am deeply indebted to so many people and organizations who have contributed immensely to shaping my academic career. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, my parents. Several people have taught me and supervised my graduate and undergraduate studies. Professor K. N. Afful of UCC supervised my undergraduate dissertation. Professor Banwako and Prof. Abena Odru, both from the University of Ghana, saw to me that I finished my MFOBD program on time. Professor D.B. Sapon, Professor Ramatu Alfasan, Reverend Dr. Azunan Krimpong, and Professor Emeritus Larry Nelson in the United States, North Carolina State University, all contributed to ensuring that my PhD thesis was done on time. Supervisor, Mr. Chairman, Professor Sapon, I want to make just one comment. He's somebody I can never forget in my life. Why? Because apart from the academic student supervisor relationship, he has gone ahead to take me as his young brother. He wanted to come here like today. They are also having a graduation program, and he is the dean of the School of Agriculture. So he couldn't. But he asked me to say one thing, which I have to tell him. You know, an NPP, an NDC, sometimes it's difficult for them to have a very cordial relationship. But this is a man 
who even during our interaction in his office, I would say, I am MDC, and he say, I am MPP. Then the relationship has remained so cordial and never affected me in our academic relationship. But Sapon is a nice person. And I think this is what the government of he has meant for me. Mr. Chairman, Professor Osawan Sari taught me statistics. And I still remember, whenever I'm in the lecture room, I still remember his teaching skills, which are school from me by he has known. He is very good in teaching pedagogy. Professor Kendall has been encouraging me. Professor David Miller. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not right that uh, in this same month, but I think around 28th. I still remember just here, here you now, when I came to, to shake hands with him. He whispered something. And I will respond to you. He whispered something to me. What did he say? Inshallah, you will be the next best. But if you have forgotten, I haven't forgotten. So all along I have been praying over the inshallah. And inshallah we are having it today. Thank you very much, Professor David Miller. And he drove all the way from where today? From the Gigpe. From the Gigpe. The Gigpe. Our Professor Sarito is here. I sent him a mail, he didn't reply, so I was afraid. So when I saw him, I was I said, yes, once I have of certain two, I think I am at home. He has been a very key influential in my academic career. Dr. Moon and Yara Asante have also influenced my life. Ladies and gentlemen, UDS funded my third degree program. They gave you steadily good pay. I don't know whether it was Dr. ABT who signed the letter or it was Mr. Queer who signed it. But all I remember is that when I applied to go for Federal State, they were afraid about it. In fact, when I was doing my M4 label, there was this scholarship. He just gave some money to students. And I was lucky. I was lucky to be a guy. It's late and I still want to acknowledge the support. EIC sponsored me to Nairobi on two occasions to make and gave me funding for the secret. And I think one of my publications, technical efficiency on rice farmers, I think is in the net that have been the output from the African Economic Research Research. From the faculty of integrated development studies, from the faculty of mathematical sciences, and from is it Iranus or Iraqis? Iraqis. In fact, I appreciate you gave me friendliness, support. Dr. Muhammad is here. So I want to acknowledge your words. And colleagues from other faculties, UDS staff from schools, institutes, and centers, I think I want to appreciate your brotherly kind of uh, encouragement. Some few weeks ago, we were here and we heard about how this university started. Some principal officers sacrificed their lives. We learned they were sitting at the mango trees to design the development plan for UPS. I think we cannot forget them. So I would like to acknowledge the effort that our first vice chancellor, Professor Arvid Bell, our first registrar, Dr. Polifa, and our first librarian, Mahadi K. IKNG, for making it possible for this enviable institution to live for. Ladies and gentlemen, I have so many names Dr. A.B. Tizakaria, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate Madam Sauda Belko. You and I have been talking about this organization, planning, and whatever. Your role has been very, very um, helpful. Dr. Abdullah Kibu, uh, even the procurement uh, director, uh, the lawyer and professor, Gordana Karanjak B. Yeah, okay. Mr. Chairman, when I had my draft, I had to give it to some people to edit for me. The head of the department of the English, uh, English department, University of Ghana, Professor Kari Daku, I don't know her, but we communicated. She edited this piece for me. And then uh, Mr. NG also had to read through, read proof, and gave me a comment. The video that we watched, I had to get some assistance to help me collect data. The pictures and whatever, they went around and did it for me. Mr. Mubarak, Abdullah Yahya, Kassim, I thank them for the excellent data collection and support. The whole video was done by Noah Nash with a company, Wavrex Company Limited. They came from Accra and I gave them some support and they went around and then did all this interview just to make the exercise complete. We saw some ladies and then um, some people were talking on the uh, background. Um, Hajia Rabi Yatusseini is a Shebata entrepreneur. She agreed to feature on the video. I thank you so much. Mr. Idi Zakaria, who is sitting right in front of me, you spoke a lot in the video. Thanks a lot. Dan Kolbele, thank you very much. And somebody who has worked so much in the industry. Maybe some of us have done researches. We have cited him. Peter Love it, but you don't know him. When I decided and Vice Chancellor agreed on this day, the next morning he sent me his booking, booking his ticket that he would be here. And thank God, Dr. Peter Love, can you rise and we see? Peter has published so much, so well on the share industry. And according to him, he has been on it for the past almost two days. He started with Dr. Higa. So he's the brain behind all the literature, or most of them that we have I think this country we need to acknowledge. Well. And I told you yesterday I was at Rumbum when they were planting the Wadawa and Shea trees. He is the brain behind it. So they have started. He's the brain behind it. Shea tree is being planted. Thank you very much. Um, the chairman of this occasion happens to be our vice minister, who has been encouraging and supporting me at this. And fortunately, fortunately, Madam Vice Chancellor too is here. Madam Vice Chancellor, I acknowledge your encouragement.
Standard man. Now this so. I think Standard man has been very, very great. He has lots of ideas, lots of encouragement. And I think he's one of the chiefs in modern region that we need to be proud of. It's an asset. The results are <laughs> Allah for all the blessings he has showered and continues to shower on me. Alhamdulillah. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, it's not easy to do this in other lecture. Prof. Mila is here. I have to send him the money notes to come and do it. He said he has forgotten. The boy was so busy. So what I told him was, oh, you mean, he said, I thought, I said, no, I could never let you. So he came again. But in the case of Professor Sedo Alassar, he was, he wanted to have done it a month ago, but I said, you are harassing too much more. <laughs> he said, I already have the money materials I want to do it. You are very busy. So, there to be a problem. I will not attempt to summarize what he said, but he has given us how important the share fee is, and then for that matter, the industry. He showed a video of what is going on and what will be done. But I have a very strong belief that he will not, oh, we say in the distant future, we may have another version of. Share presentation in this room, which we'll be looking at the other side, of the scientific side of it, I give it from the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for as Prof. Sebaras and come back down here. Come and receive your congratulations. And we are going to start with your spices. <laughs> So, Madam number one, number two, come and look at place, Professor Zedu Alassi. Thank you. 
government for our business and uh, not to forget the prison of God. It's a pretext. Where are they? Are you here, Miss Cap? Thank you. 